Hi guys, Pastor Yanni here. Pastor Krubus, welcome, welcome. We are so happy about you joining us for this course that we are doing. This is the first session of our Survey of the Bible, and we are glad that you decided to join us. Amen. If you want to get a book, please leave your name and number in the comments and we'll contact you. And also, if you have any questions regarding these sessions, write them down in the comments so we can get back to you regarding those questions. And before the session next week, answer some of those questions. Amen. That's a good idea. So we're going to grow together and we're really happy that you are going to uh, join us in this course. God bless you. Enjoy the first session and then uh, next Sunday we will join one another again. Well, welcome to Teach Every Nation's newest course, Survey of the Bible. And it is going to be unlike any other course you've ever taken because we're going to speed teach. And if we do our job speed teaching you, guess what you're going to experience? Speed learning. Because we're going to take a look at this most amazing book, the most amazing book of all time, the Bible. Everywhere I travel, people say, you know, I wish I understood more about this book, but there's so many people, so many places I get lost all the time. I read Genesis, Exodus, I get into Leviticus, I don't know what's going on, and I, I want to read it more, but I, I just can't find my way and understand. Well, guess what? We heard you. We made this course just for you. And we've taken this course, and, and unlike all the other courses that we at Teach Every Nation have done, some of the courses are skill courses, like anyone can become a great communicator and how to double your church and your business, or a heart course like the biblical portrait of marriage or what on earth is God doing in my life. This course isn't. This is a memorization course. We want to put the truth of God's word inside of you so you never get lost again. It's called the survey of the Bible. And what we've done is we've taken this and we said, this is our material. How can we boil it all down till we get the minimum that you, you got to know to say you understand? And then we take that minimum and we redevelop it till it's easy for your mind. And it kind of slips in. It's called mind easy. Then we take it in its mind easy form. You're going to have a ball in this course. And we take it and we help you memorize it. And we approach that various ways until you say to yourself, you know what, I got this. I, I don't even have to study. I got it together. Well, that's what this course is all about. Now, what are the goals of this course? How can we teach this to you in just a short period of time? Well, we've taken this book and we approach it this way and this way and this way and this way and this way. We study the books of the Bible. Then we study the places of the Bible. So if it fall, you're reading and you read about Assyria, you'll know where that is on the map. Then we tell you the story so that you can actually, without, without any notes or anything, start from creation and go all the way through the end of the Old Testament. And then in the second half of the course, when we deal with the New Testament, you can do the same thing. And then we deal with the people of the Old and New Testament and the periods. I mean, it is going to be unlike anything you've ever experienced. But it's an awful lot of books, isn't it? Take a look at all these books, all 66 books. <laughs> We are going to study those and you're going to have it, but watch out because I can promise you one thing. You'll never know what's going to happen next when you're in a Teach Every Nation course. Well, welcome to the Bible Library. Do you know a simple way how to remember how many books there are in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, come on and join with me over here to our touch screen and let me show you. You'll never forget. Think about the word Bible because it has two parts to it. In your Bible, there is the Old Testament. Do you know how many books are in the Old Testament? Well, let me show you a way to remember. How many letters are here? One, two, three. Uh huh. How many letters are there in the word testament? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's how many books there are in the Old Testament. You'll never forget it. Now, let's take a look at the word, the New Testament. If I spell it right, it should be the same number of letters. There are one, two, three, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Many people say, I love the Old Testament, but my favorite is the New. 
I'm, I like it more times, many times more. Well, what's three times nine? It's 27. Guess how many books there are in the New Testament? 27. And when you add these two numbers together on most days, what do you get? You get 66. Guess how many books there are in the Bible? 66. All right, say it with me. How many books in the Old Testament? 39. How many books in the New Testament? 27. You got it? Well, then turn in your workbook. And let's see if we can't summarize that. Number one, the number of books in the Bible is... 66. The number of books in the Old Testament is 39, and the number of books in the New Testament is 27. Here are three of my favorite quotes about the Bible. Patrick Henry said, the Bible is worth all other books which have ever been printed. And Daniel Webster said, I make it a practice to read the Bible through once every year. And Charles Hodge said, the best evidence of the Bible's being the Word of God is found between its covers. Now that you know that the Old Testament is composed of 39 books, the next question is, how are those Old Testament books organized? You may have wondered why the books of the Old Testament are in the order they are in your Bible. Because, believe it or not, many of the books are out of chronological order. Take a look at these books for a minute. Here's our Old Testament library of all 39 books, starting with Genesis. Let's just pick a book in the middle of these two shelves. How about Nehemiah? You would think if this was in the order in which it was written, that Nehemiah takes place before Job and Psalms and Proverbs and all these prophets, but it doesn't. It's out of order. In fact, guess what? This book, the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi, or the Italian prophet as we call him, Malachi, they are contemporaries. Do you see that? Nehemiah is way over here, but it belongs in time over here. And if you didn't know the answer to how the Old Testament is organized, you, you may be confused as you try to understand how, how, do, how do I read this Old Testament so it makes sense to me? Well, the books are organized, therefore, by the type of book that it is, not the time of the contents of the book. Let's see if we can't summarize that, but we're going to get into it now. And I want to, if you don't mind, take off my, my professorial coat even though I have my professorial bow tie on, and I have my father's, our father's original uh, pocket watch, which is now 88 years old, and we're right on schedule. But let's go over our touch screen for a minute and see if we can't give you some more helpful insights. This is going to help you a lot. When you think of the Old Testament, you realize that the Old Testament has 39 books by now, And it has three parts to it. And that's how many parts there are in the Old Testament. The first one has 17 books in the first part. And the middle part and the third part. The third part has the same number of books as the first part. So guess how many books are in the third part? That's right, 17. And since there are 39 books in the Old Testament, and there's 17, and 17 is 34, which leaves there's five in the middle. That's how the books are organized, not by time, but by type. Well, what's this type? Thanks for asking. This is called the historical books, and there are 17 of those. And this is called the poetical books. See that different type? And there's five. And this is called the prophetical books. And you already know by now how many books are in there. So let's review for a minute. Say this with me. The Bible has 66 books. Say it out loud. The Old Testament has 39 books. The New Testament, 27 books. And the Old Testament has how many parts? Three parts. That's it. You're getting it. Historical books, 17. Poetical books, 5. Prophetical books, 17. Now fill in your workbook as we review this just one more time. But let me kind of... Um, Get a more professional looking like your workbook. So on your chart, on the left-hand column, write down the words historical, 17. In the middle, write down the word poetical, 5. You already know this by now. And prophetical, 17. Now these two long columns are divided even further to help us remember it. Right in here, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is called the Pentateuch. Penta means five. We've also known this as the books of Moses. 
And the bottom isn't, uh, doesn't have an, a, a separate name, it's just called historical. But when you move over to the prophetical books, if you've ever noticed, these books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, are long books, and all the rest of them are shorter. So they've named it the major prophets, and there's five of them, and the minor, there are 12. I want to just show you three more things, as you can write in your workbook. Th these right here, these are the... These are the stories, the stories about the entire Bible, which means the things that are here and here fit back into these stories. And the middle one is in this story, there were some people like David and Solomon that wrote songs and wisdom and poems. And then right here, the prophetical books from Isaiah through Malachi, those are the sermons that God used to preach through the prophets to the people of Israel. And so he sent prophets to preach to the kings, the priests, the elders, the people about what God wanted them to do and to stop doing. Now let's stop for a minute and make three other key observations that you can, you can write on your chart because it's really an eye-opener. For instance, if this is the story, then why don't we just draw a line from here to here and from now on, You'll never be confused. The story begins here and it ends there. That's where it fits. Which means then you should be able to put all these books over here and all these books over here, and you can. For instance, how about just taking one book, the book of Psalms. Who, who wrote most of the Psalms? David. That's right. And he lived in the story. And the question is, which book did he live in? He lived in the book of 2 Samuel. Now you know. So when you read in 2 Samuel, that's where the Psalms fit. Well, who wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon? That's right, he, he, Solomon did. So these three books were written by one person, David's son, and he lives. Where did he live? He, he lived right here in 1 Kings. Is this called fitting together to you? Well, you may be thinking to yourself, whoa, whoa where do... I can't imagine where all those prophetical books go. I mean, that's all 17 books. Uh, think about it. Is it up here? No. Nope. Does it overlap Samuel? No, it doesn't. Well, where do they all fit? Every one of those books fit from 2 Kings all the way through to Esther. All of these are scrunched back here. Why? Because Israel started to live in more and more sin and God wanted to challenge them. Please stop. Please repent. I don't want to have to judge you. Well, you got it? The Bible has 66 books, you know this. Old Testament, 39 books, three parts. Historical books, 17. Poetical books, five. And prophetical books, 17. But now, let's take a look just a little deeper. And uh, let's take all 39 books of the Old Testament and stack them on my desk. Well, there you have it, all 39 books of the Bible in a complete library for you. But I, I want you to think about what you just saw, because you may remember the 10 course we had, how to teach so your students excel. We talked about how to speed teach. <laughs> how about that as an illustration? Well, let's go back to this, because what I want to do is to take what we put on the touch screen and make it more tangible to you and to me, because many of us learn uh, more visually. So let's take... Yeah, uh, 39 books. The story doesn't here and end there. The story begins here and it ends at the end of the historical books, which is, uh, I think, the book of Esther. So if we were to just move these down here, what you have are the 17 historical books. And there's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, which means all of these prophetical books let's move those out too about the same distance so what you have here are the 17 historical the five poetical and the 17 prophetical all right let's take what we reviewed a minute ago just to get this in your mind for one more time what we have here is the 17 historical books and the five poetical books and the 17 prophetical books. You remember what we had at the bottom of that? 
we have three other phrases for you because the first one is all about the, remember it? All about the stories of the Old Testament. And the middle part is all about the songs and the poems. And the last part are all about the sermons that took place back here. Well, now you got it. In a few moments, we're going to come back to these 39 books, and you're going to see one of the most amazing ahas when I'll take this apart and restack every one of these 39 books where they actually fit with the historical books. Well, how about that? You've already learned a lot about the books of the Bible in only a couple of minutes, and we're just getting started. I just realized, you know, 66 books in the Bible, two parts, the Old Testament, 39 books, the New Testament, 27 books. You got it. But before learning more about the Old Testament books, how about I just share the story with you of the Old Testament on this map in, uh, in, in about two minutes. Let's try it. Ready, set, go. The Old Testament starts up here with creation and the fall of man, and God eventually calls Abraham and promised the land. He lives where he was born in Ur and travels around to Canaan, where he had Ishmael and Isaac. And eventually, Joseph is sold into Egypt, and there's a famine, and the Jews go into Egypt. Then God raises up Moses, who leads the people out of Egypt through the Red Sea, down to Mount Sinai, and they wander in the wilderness until Moses dies. Then Joshua crosses the Jordan River, destroys Jericho, conquers the land, divides it up into 12 tribes. And there was a period of judges where different people ruled. And at the end of the Judges, a new period begins called uh, the United Kingdom, where one king ruled all of this land, like David. And then, after Solomon died, his son came on, and he was a terrible leader. The people said, we don't want to follow him at all. And the nation split in half, just like this. This was Israel, and this was Judah. And eventually, God raised up Assyria up here, who came down and conquered Israel and scattered them up here. And later on, the Babylonians came around here and conquered Judah and brought them back to live in Babylon. We call this the exile. Then Persia came and conquered Babylon. And the Persians said, go ahead and go back home. And so they did in three waves to rebuild the temple and the walls under Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah. And believe it or not, that's the story of the Old Testament in less than two minutes. You see, that's the irreducible minimum. Well, now that you know that the Old Testament books are organized by the type of book and not by the time that each book occurred, let's take a deeper look so that you can understand the Old Testament a lot more thoroughly. But first, we have to take these books and put them back on here. How do the Old Testament books really fit together since they're out of order? Well, I'm going to take these down one at a time and set them where they belong and put the books on top of them if they occurred on the same time. There's Genesis. That's one of the major story books. Then follows Exodus, which follows right upon the end of Genesis. Then comes Leviticus. And believe it or not, Leviticus only takes place in a few weeks right between Exodus and the next major historical book, which is... Numbers. The history doesn't really go much in Leviticus. And then when you come to the book of Deuteronomy, it may surprise you, but there's, there's hardly any story here except Moses died. This is when he gets up and he preaches his last sermon and reviews the history, and it's, it takes place in about a month. And then we have the next two books, which are uh, historical books that follow the story and continue it going. So if you want to read the Old Testament in order, you'd read Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges. And the next book we come to is the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth doesn't take place after the book of Judges. Instead, it takes place during the book of Judges. So now we change gears, as you'll learn when we talk about the periods, the periods of the Old Testament. But things change now. And we have some really important major books in our story. Here's 1 Samuel, followed by 2 Samuel, continues the story. And then 1 and 2 Kings continues that storyline, moving right along. And then all of a sudden it stops. And there are some books which repeat the story. It's uh, the story that's taken place over here. And it's in First and Second Chronicles. They don't go after First and Second Kings. 
in a sense, what they do is these books give you the story of the political nature of what happened in history. And these books give you, uh, I guess you could say they give you the priestly perspective. And we're going to put the book of First Chronicles over Second Samuel. And although Second Chronicles covers both of these, we're going to put it over here on top of Second Kings because that's where it basically fits. And we're going to realize that what happens here is something surprising. It's not really talked about as far as the history in the Old Testament. You'll learn this in the periods. But this is when Israel and Judah are destroyed and uh, Judah goes over to Babylon and is exiled there. And there really isn't a story that continues through those 70 years. So we actually made a, uh, another little book that really isn't a book of the Bible, but I want you to see it. It's called The Exile. And it really is a unique 70-year period. And then we have the books Ezra is next, picking up actually from the end of these two books. And then Nehemiah. And then you would think Esther's at the end. But it's not. Esther takes place during the period of the book of Ezra. So if you wanted to read the story of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Ezra, Nehemiah, and you're done. It's 11 books. This exile is kind of in the middle. It's just there's no book here. We're just putting it as a placeholder. Now, the next thing you want to do is to take a look at those five poetical books, and where, where do they fit in all this? Well, Job is, uh, could be the oldest book in the Bible, but most scholars put it at about the time of Abraham. So that's way over here in Genesis. And when you come to the book of Psalms, you know that the book of Psalms was written by King David, and King David lived at 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles, and that's where that book fits. Got it? Then the next three books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, they fit over here, and we want to put those just like this, because that's when Solomon lived. Now we get to the 17 prophetical books. Earlier in the session, you learned that they didn't take place all the way over there, or here, or David, or Solomon, which means they fit all at the end. Now the question is, where do they all fit? Well, let's take Isaiah. Where do you think it fits? It fits right here. And where does Jeremiah fit? Well, on B. <laughs> it fits right here. This is an important part. And where does Lamentations fit? Oh, it fits right here as well. You see, what was taking place here, Israel and Judah were rebelling so much against God that God kept sending them prophets because he didn't want to judge them. And then we have two other books that happened in this exile period. They happened over in Babylon. And they are Ezekiel and Daniel. And we'll talk all about this in the rest of the course. So now we have all these other prophets. Where do they fit? Do you know? Do you realize how much you're picking up right here? Let's take a look at Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Okay, where do they fit? Well, <laughs> they fit right here, the same period. And this one. And Amos and Obadiah. <laughs> We're getting pretty tall. You go back and you read the Old Testament books here, you realize God is really preaching, sending person after person to preach to Israel and Judah, repent, don't live this way. Okay. All right, so where, where, do, where do all these books, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, where do they fit? Well, they fit on top of these. <laughs> Now you're getting, this is really the crisis of the Old Testament, is right here. And now we have the last, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They don't preach over here, that's Ezekiel and Daniel. In the lifetime of Ezra, you have Haggai, you have Zechariah, and as you learned earlier in this session, Nehemiah and Malachi work together. Well, there you have it. You have the entire Old Testament and how it fits together. Well, it's hard to believe that we're already at the end of our first session. 
you must be saying, I have seen and learned so much, I can't believe it. But now I want to back away for a minute, because when you realize that the books of the Bible had over 40 different authors who wrote during a period of over a thousand years, maybe you've wondered, you know, uh, how could it, something that started in the Garden of Eden uh, have a unified message to the very end? And so I want you to know that I wanted the same thing. So I decided to compare two things, the first three chapters of the Bible with the last three chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1, 2, 3, and Revelation 20, 21, and 22. And I wanted to know, how did what God start in the Garden of Eden conclude 66 books later? Do the books of the Bible really tell a unified story? Oh, man, wait till you see. You'll never have room for doubt again about the Bible. Just think about this. A thousand years, 40, 40 different authors, all 66 books. How, how could these two, beginning and the end, really work together? Well, the unity of the Bible, as you're going to see, is a supernatural thing. So let's take a look at what I found when I compared the first three chapters with the last three chapters. I'm going to give you Genesis and then Revelation. Here's Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Revelation, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. In Genesis, it says, the darkness he called night. In Revelation, it says, there shall be no night there. In Genesis, it says, God made two great lights, the sun and the moon. In Revelation, it says, the city has no need of the sun or of the moon. In Genesis, it says, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. In Revelation, it says, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow. In Genesis, Satan appears as the deceiver of mankind. But in Revelation, Satan disappears into the lake of fire forever. I mean, just think about what you're hearing. In Genesis, shown a garden into which defilement entered. But in Revelation, shown a city Quote, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles. In Genesis, the walk of God with man is interrupted, but in Revelation, the walk of God with man is resumed. In Genesis, it's the initial victory of the serpent, but in Revelation, it's the ultimate victory of the lamb. In Genesis, I will greatly multiply your pain. Revelation, neither shall there be pain anymore. In Genesis, cursed is the ground for your sake. There shall be no more curse. Man's dominion is damaged in the fall of Adam in Genesis, but in Revelation, man's dominion is restored in the reign of Christ. The first paradise was closed, but in Revelation, the new paradise is actually opened. Access to the tree of life, we lost in Adam in Genesis, but in Revelation, the access to the tree of life we regain in Christ. They were driven from God's presence, but in Revelation, oh, we shall see his face. Isn't that just amazing? God, God, from the beginning of all time, planned the conclusion and used 40 plus authors, 66 books over a thousand years, and the, every single part that began and was ruined with the fall of man comes through at the other end. <laughs> God completed that which he started. Maybe that's why Billy Graham, when he thought about the Bible, summarized all this. It's one of my favorite quotes. He said, listen, I've read the last page of the Bible. It's going to turn out all right. Uh, the Bible, God's holy scriptures for you and for me today.